So today, I want to answer these two questions. <clears throat> Why do innocent people suffer? Why does God let hurt happen? It, it seems almost fair to us on one level that when someone experiences painful consequences from choices they made, which were disobedient to God, well, that's kind of like, okay, dude, that figures. That's almost like fair in our thinking. What really troubles us is when some innocent person who did nothing wrong gets hit by the problems. Like, like something happens and I get hurt and I did nothing wrong. Or some innocent, like a child gets cancer or something like that. You just scratch your head and you say, you know, God, that's not fair. Or some wicked evil guy lives to be an old man and some upstanding fine young man gets killed. You just shake your head and you say, I wouldn't mind if the guilty suffered, but it's when the innocent suffer. That's what I don't understand, God. Why do you let that stuff happen? It's not fair. <clears throat> so I want to address this. And the answer that I have for you is going to require you to think. On, on, on the first level, you may not find it satisfactory. But the more you think about it, the more it will satisfy the intellectual component of, of, of your need to know. So I want you to know this. When you listen to me teach a half-hour sermon, you're getting the tip of the iceberg. There's years of study and volumes of reading and research behind it. So don't just listen to it twice, once. Go to our webpage, www.fardaletrinitychurch.org, and listen to these sermons again. It's not the kind of topic you can just take a little taste of and walk away from. You need to think it through. Why do innocent people suffer and why does God let hurt happen? Now, here's my answer based on the scripture. And I'm going to show you a lot of scripture to back up my answer. I'm going to validate my answer using God's word. The short answer is God uses suffering and pain. That's why he allows it. <clears throat> because he uses it. He can accomplish his purposes for his glory and our good through the suffering and pain that we observe and experience in this life. Now, I want to show you that from the Bible. The first thing you need to understand is that this life is not the way God created it to be. God uses pain to alert us to the fact that something is seriously wrong down here, folks. Something is seriously wrong with this world. Now, we know what that is. It is the consequence of sin. Remember Genesis 3. It's a perfect world. It's all very good. And then God says, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Adam and Eve eat of it. They rebel against God. Enter sin. Enter unpleasant consequences for sin. So the consequence of sin was death. It was both spiritual and physical. But the curse that God placed on man was a lot more than death. The curse included more than death. It increased mankind's pain and his sense of futility with this life. It increased mankind's pain and sense of futility in this life. Now, the whole world suffers the effects of man's sin. The whole world is under what the Bible calls the curse. And this curse is corruption. The effects of man's sin are all things that hurt him. None of the effects of sin are good. They bring pain and hurt. Here's some scripture to show you. This is the book of Romans. Paul the Apostle wrote it. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. The fall of man brought a curse by God, 
but it didn't just go to man. It went to the world over which man was caretaker, over which he exercised dominion. And it was the perfect punishment. In the same way that man is supposed to live in submission to God's dominion, the earth was supposed to be in submission to man's dominion. So when man shook his fist in God's face and rebelled against him, God said, okay, I'm going to let you know how that feels all the days of your life. The earth will be in rebellion against you. And here you see it in Romans. The curse covers all the world. And we live all of our days aware that it's not good the way it sounds like in Genesis chapter 1. At the end of the first chapter of Genesis, six times it says it was all good. Well, how come it's not all good now? How come it's a lot of bad and evil and suffering now? Because it's not now the way God created it to be. The whole world suffers the effects of man's sin and is experiencing the curse and corruption. Now, someday God will restore the world to its pre-fall condition. And that's where Revelation says there will no longer be any curse. Here's the scripture. I want to validate what I'm saying to you. This is the last two chapters of the Bible, the book of Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and earth had passed away. There's no longer any sea. I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death, no longer any mourning, no crying, pain, The first things have passed away, and he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He said, Write these words down, for they are faithful and true. There will no longer be any curse. No curse. Eden restored a new heaven and a new earth, a fresh start. That's what God promises. So someday he will restore the world to its pre-fall condition, and there will no longer be any curse. Without the curse, though, without the curse, which brings pain and suffering, mankind would live blissfully unaware that something's wrong. My wife's not here this morning. She hasn't been feeling well. She was coughing a lot last night, had joint pain, was chilly. So this morning, Sandy has a fever. Well, the fever's not the problem. The fever is the symptom Were it not for the pain, she would not know that she has an infection. See, if you don't have pain, you will just continue on blissfully unaware that something's wrong. And that's the way we are. Honestly, when does God have your attention most? When life is hurting me most. It's the way we are. Without the curse which brings pain and suffering, mankind would live blissfully unaware that something's very wrong. See, God uses pain to alert us that something is seriously wrong with this world. I've given you this quote before. It's one you should know. It's by C.S. Lewis. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Here's another way of saying it. If he didn't let sin hurt us, we wouldn't hear and heed him. If he didn't let sin hurt us, we would not hear and heed him. See, God uses pain to alert us to the fact that something's wrong with this world, but he also uses pain to alert us to the fact that something is specifically wrong with us. It's not just the world. It's me, his creature. The fact is a larger percentage of the pain and suffering experienced on this earth is directly caused by God's creatures, not just the world at large. I know there's a lot of pain and suffering through sickness and through accidents and disease, but look at your life. How much pain, if you could like make little, a little chart, How much pain has come into your life because you were sick? Okay, how much pain has come into your life because of something someone did or said or something you did or said? For most people, by far, 
the greater portion of pain in their life is because of some sin that someone or themselves did. The fact is, we bring it on ourselves. Just look at the Ten Commandments. What if we just obeyed the last six? The first four tell us how we should relate to God. No other gods, no idols, uh, respect his name and respect his day. But look at the next six. Honor your father and mother. That means like obey your parents. No murder, no adultery, no stealing, no lying, no coveting. If we just obeyed the bottom six, we'd get along with each other just fine. But so much hurt comes from the violation of God's rules for living. God uses our pain to alert us to the fact that something is specifically wrong with us. We have a rebel streak. Satan and other fallen angels are God's creatures who rebelled against God and they cause a lot of suffering and pain in this world, tons of it. And God allows people to experience the pain that Satan and the demons cause. Now, sovereignly and mercifully, God has used the pain and suffering caused by Satan and demons to shape people's character, thereby bringing some good from what they intended as evil only. That's an important point for you to catch. In his sovereignty and his mercy, God uses the pain and suffering caused by Satan and demons to shape character, and he brings good from what was intended for evil only. Satan and the demon world have no intention that you should forge godly character, but that's what God's doing with the pain and suffering that they bring into this world. I give you Job as an example. We covered Job last week. I'm not going to reteach him. I just want you to know the good that came to him from all of this, in spite of all the pain. In the first two chapters, we see that God permitted Satan to wreck the guy's life. And God was glorified by the fact that Job maintained his integrity and trusted God through it all. Remember how Job began his trial with a great attitude? Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then later he says, shall we indeed accept good from God and not adversity also? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So Job started his trial strong. He started it walking closely with God and he, he did well. But as the trial dragged on, he questioned God. Here's just some verses from Job chapter 10. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Tell me what charges you have against me. Oh, dude, you're talking to God? Yeah, my life's a mess. I'm ruined, and I want him to give me an answer. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands while you smile on the schemes of the wicked? There's a lot of bad guys who are doing just fine, Lord, and I am ruined. So he's challenging God. Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? You bring new witnesses against me and increase your anger toward me. Your forces come against me wave upon wave. Why did you even bring me out of the womb? I wish I had died before any eye saw me. Okay, you know, he, he began his trial well, but it was a long one. And he's at the point now where he's wanting some answers from God. And so he's calling him out. The trial dragged on. He questioned God. By chapter 31, he's outright complaining to God. Oh, that I had someone to hear me. I now sign my defense. It's the end of a long chapter where he defends his integrity. So he knows this isn't happening because he's been a bad guy and God's punishing him. So after that long chapter, he says, I sign my defense. I wish you'd hear me. Let the Almighty answer me. He's calling God out. But his prayers seem to bounce off heaven like the clouds are made of brass. All he has is pain and suffering and it drags on and on. And the counselors who come to help him only trouble him. And he's calling out, complaining to God, challenging God. But in the end, in the end, this good man realized, who am I to question you? Here's what he says. Then Job replied to the Lord. This is, verse, this is chapter 42, mind you. I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. That should be a capital Y. You asked, 
This is God's question. Who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? And now Job says, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, this is the Lord speaking, Listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you answer me. And then Job says, My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. So what happened to Job? Well, God permitted Job, to, uh, Satan, to wreck his life. But I want you to follow the progression. God was glorified by the fact that Job maintained his integrity and trusted God through it all. He began his trial with the right attitude, but as the trial dragged on, he questioned God and he complained against God. But in the end, he realized, who am I to question you, Lord? Here's the point. Job grew spiritually. He already walked with God, but at the end of the trial, he walked closer. Job grew in his relationship with God through his trial. Because God uses pain to alert us that something's wrong specifically with us, and even the best of us needs to grow spiritually. Here's another example, Paul the Apostle. Paul's physical problem was satanic in origin. I believe it was an eye problem. Here's how Paul explains it. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, the things he had seen from God, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. So Paul's physical problem was satanic in origin. He calls it a messenger from Satan. But God used it for Paul's good to keep him from exalting himself. Paul the apostle asked God for relief. Lord, please take this away from me. Please take this ailment away. Please take this thorn away. I could be so much more effective for you if you would please take this away. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that, I might, that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Power is perfected in weakness. God said, no, I want you to grow. Wow. Paul the apostle asked God three times to take this problem away so I can be more effective in ministry. And God says, no, I want you to grow. Paul grew spiritually, in this case, in humility through his trial. So here's the deal. Satan and fallen angels are creatures who have rebelled against God. They cause a lot of suffering and pain in this world. They ruin Job's life. They probably ruin Paul's eyes. But God used it to grow both of those men who were already good men when the trial hit. How much more do I need to grow? But it's not just Satan and the fallen angels. People cause an immeasurable amount of pain to each other and themselves. And here's the deal. Sometimes we can see where God sovereignly and mercifully uses the pain and suffering to shape character, thereby bringing some good from what was intended only for evil. Sometimes we can see it, but a lot of times we can't. A lot of times we can't see any good coming from the evil that people do. All I live with is hurt. Don't you have that happen to you? People cross paths in your life. They say or do things that hurt you. They move on and have fun and you're left with the hurt. So what's the point of that, God? Well, sometimes you're not going to see the good that comes from the bad stuff that people do. I just want to prove that to you from scripture. I want you to look at the following scripture. I'm going to go through it quickly and I'm going to show you there's some bad stuff that people do. I want you to note the evil that was done and I want you to note whether or not the sufferer saw any good that came from it. Let's see if the person suffering saw good from it. I'll just start with the basics. Abel was murdered by Cain. He didn't say any good from that. I still don't. This guy named Lamech killed two men, probably murder. Those two guys didn't see any good from it. I still don't. Hagar, she disrespected Sarah, such that Sarah mistreated her and she fled. Then Hagar, in the desert, fleeing, had an encounter with God. 
And she named her son Ishmael, which means God hears. And she named the place where she met God, God sees. So Hagar did see the good that came from her bad situation. And she instigated it by disrespecting her, uh, her mistress. So she, she did see some good that came from it. How about Laban? Laban deceived Jacob. I mean, look what we got here. Murder, killing, disrespect, mistreating each other, deception. Well, Jacob didn't see any good from this at first. But later in his life, he could look on the 12 sons born to him by the two women and their two maids. The point is, he was God's man with God's blessing and someone deceived him and tricked him. And he saw no good from it at first, but over time he could see the good that God brought from it. How about Joseph sold into slavery? Man, that stinks by his brothers. He did not see any good from that, not for years and years and years. Then, as a righteous, good, honorable, upright servant in a man's house, he gets falsely accused and gets thrown into prison. Well, he didn't see any good coming from that at the time. But later in his life, he saw that what his brothers meant for evil, God meant for good, to keep many people alive. Here's what he says in chapter 50, verse 20 in the book of Genesis. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive because he wound up being second in command of all of Egypt and he wound up managing the food supplies during the famine. And he gave food to the sons of Jacob, his brothers, and kept the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob alive gave them the best of the land in Egypt and they grew to be a nation there in Egypt over the next 400 years. <clears throat> there's something wrong with God's creatures, not just the angels and the demons. There's something wrong with us. And what we want to do when we experience suffering is know why. And here's the thing. All kinds of evil I just showed you, deception, murder, mistreatment, disrespect. Some people find out why. Some people never see why. How about the Exodus? In Exodus chapter 1, a new king arises in Egypt who doesn't know jo Joseph. He enslaves the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish people. Then Pharaoh ordered the Egyptian midwives to kill all the baby boys like, God, where are you now? And when that order didn't work, he ordered that all the baby boys be thrown into the Nile River. The people did not see any good from any of this, but God used it to raise up Moses and to move the people of Israel to cry out to him. How about Acts chapter 7? Stephen is telling people about Jesus and he gets stoned to death for it. Then a great persecution rises against the infant church. But the persecution scattered the Christians, and so the effect was it spread the gospel. And one of the guys who was standing there as Stephen was stoned to death, watching the coats of the men doing the stoning, was this guy named Saul. And Saul later becomes the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> sometimes you see the good that comes from the hurt, but sometimes you don't. Stephen didn't. He just got stoned to death for telling people about Jesus. <clears throat> How about the book of Hebrews? Don't you love chapter 11? The great roll call of the faithful through the ages and all of their great victories. But then at the very end of the chapter, it shows you all the people who were faithful who saw no victory. The fact is many people suffer without ever seeing the good that comes from it. In their lifetime, they never see it. Here's the point. <clears throat> All through the Bible, we see that God uses pain and suffering to alert us to the fact that something's wrong. God wants to get our attention, and he wants us to look to him for the answers. You may never understand why, or you may. You may not see any good come from it, or you may. But you know who God is, and you know what he's like, and that is enough to respond properly to him. See, God uses suffering not just to alert us to the fact that something's wrong. He uses it to reflect us. Do you want to really see yourself? 
the real test of your character, the real revealer of your character is in how you act when everything's fine. The real test of your character is how do you respond when life hits the fan? So your response to suffering reflects the depth and the closeness of your friendship with God. Job's an excellent example. Great example of a person whose response to suffering reflected his close relationship with God. Right? Job arose, shaved his head, sign of mourning, fell to the ground, worshipped God. Wow, after losing all of his wealth and all of his family. That's how he responded. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Job's a great example of a person whose response to suffering reflected his close relationship with God. But even he had to grow spiritually. After questioning God and complaining and asking why, he later said, I retract and I repent. Who am I to question you? Good man. While it's true that some people respond to suffering by rebelling against God, many others respond by paying more attention to him. And that's how I want to respond. They see life more clearly. They pay more attention to spiritual realities. They grow a closer relationship with God and they depend on him more and on self less. Isn't that what he wants from us? They depend on him more and self less. Remember what Paul said? We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia. We were burdened excessively beyond our strength. We despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I'll boast about my weakness so the power of Christ may dwell in me. Your response to suffering does more than reflect who you really are. It directs who you become. This is key. This is key. God uses pain and suffering to direct you because your response to suffering directs your relationship with God as much as it reflects it. It steers the direction of your life. God aims to direct your attention to him through your suffering. So pain can therefore be for your good and for his glory. Your response to what life throws at you needs to be faith in God's wisdom, power, love, and plan. Your response to what life throws at you needs to be faith in God's wisdom, power, love, and plan. Just like all those people I showed you earlier in the Bible. In Hebrews chapter 11, I mentioned to you that we read of people whom God allowed to be ill-treated and to suffer, and they died not knowing why God allowed them to be mistreated. The end of the great stuff that the people of faith accomplished is the first phrase in verse 35. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Then there's a whole shift of tone. But others were tortured not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourging, yes, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And yet these people are commended for their faith. They died never seeing the good that came from all of that ill treatment. They died never knowing why God allowed them. But the next two verses tells us that God's plan is to remember and reward their faithfulness in eternity forever. Here's the next two verses. All of these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. What he's talking about is heaven. This life is not all there is. This isn't heaven. And so you will have pain and suffering and hurt and heartache in this life. But God uses that stuff. He uses it to show you that something's wrong here. He uses it to reflect your true person. And he uses it to direct the person you will become. 
Paul teaches that we should see our present troubles in light of eternity. Take the long view. Don't look at life through, you know, like a tube. Use the wide angle lens. Step back and look at the horizon. Paul says, I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. We need to remember what the rest of the story will be. This isn't the end of the story and all the data is not in. So don't make judgment yet as to whether or not God's right or wrong, fair or unfair, based on what you're experiencing. God's final, his ultimate response to pain and suffering is to end it and all for all those who are his children. He will end it in his good time. What I want you to do as I close is always consider Jesus. On Friday, Jesus suffered mistreatment. Actually, it began the night before on Thursday. He was condemned to death at an unjust trial. He was scourged and then crucified. From noon to three, he was alone in the darkness. His father had forsaken him. He felt forsaken by his father. God seemed silent, distant, and absent. And for all practical purposes, he was. And then Jesus died. And when he died, hope died. And evil triumphed. That's what happened on that Friday. But then Sunday came. Jesus' resurrection gave a whole new meaning to what had happened on the cross. And looking back, we now call that dark crucifixion Friday, Good Friday. We call that day Good Friday because Sunday came. And Sunday, the resurrection to life, makes us interpret Friday and the death totally different. God uses troubles, pain, and suffering to direct us to himself and to direct our thoughts to the eternal perspective. But we have a will. Suffering either drives us away from him or drives us to him. The choice is ours. Hopefully in the future, we will look back on our past suffering and see it as having been good for us and glorifying to God. So why do innocent people suffer? And why does God let hurt happen? Well, the short answer is God uses suffering and pain. He uses pain to alert us that something is seriously wrong with this world. He uses pain to alert us that something is specifically wrong with us, his creatures. He uses pain to reflect us and he uses pain to direct us. If you want this sermon in one statement, God uses our suffering and pain for our good and his glory. God uses our suffering and our pain for our good and his glory.